so being the fist doctor and all, you, you obviously, do you, do you have a favorite doctor yourself? And also, what in your experience as being the doctor was the best experience? What stood out to you? Uh, my favorite doctor, um, I shall eliminate David Tennant from this list. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, it would just not be fair. Um, uh, and my favorite doctor was Patrick Troughton because I grew up with him. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think, you know, I've seen a lot of T-shirts. You never forget your first doctor. Uh, um, but I suppose William Hartnell, strictly speaking, was my, my first doctor. But Patrick Troughton, I always thought, had the most difficult job. He was the first regeneration. No one had ever came, come up with this idea before. And I remember sitting down and, uh, to watch his first episode with great trepidation, thinking no one could really replace William Hartnell, because he was my doctor. And within the space of that one episode, he had captured everyone's imagination and come up with this brilliant performance. So uh, he's my favorite. As to what's the best thing about it is, it's just for a boy, especially, you know, it's just, you know, you, you go out in the street when you're a kid and you play saving the universe. And here I was doing it for a living. It was just, it was a fantastic job to do. Um, you know, because you were almost, you know, you're awesome. I, I described it once as instant charisma. You know, suddenly you're walking down the, the street and inevitably people call out, where's your TARDIS, mate? Um, it's just that everyone suddenly knows you and that you're suddenly you're thrust into this extraordinary world where, you know, children are too, too not, not terrified, but they're too kind of stunned to speak to you. You'd meet them. So many, I met a couple of today, actually, who just, when it comes up to it, they're just almost too scared to speak to you. And to have that effect on someone just because you're playing a part is extraordinary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. If I can quickly interject on the topic of, you know, making that transition from one doctor to another, have you had a chance to talk to Peter Capaldi and have you offered him any advice or does he need any in your opinion? <laughs> I don't think he needs any advice and I'd never dare to give him any advice on the acting at all. I suppose if anyone needs advice, it is exactly what we were talking about then. It's the, the everything that comes with it. Mm. But I, at the end of the program, you know, where he was announced, which I was on, uh, and I hadn't met him before that, but at the end, uh, when they were firing confetti at him or something, uh, uh, they, they, they said to us, right, go on, go on and sort of shake his hand and, and, and give him a hug. So I went on and, and I gave him a hug and then I just whispered in his ear, what the hell have you done? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the sum total of my advice to him. I like it. Hello. Hello. Um, so my question is, um, what exactly happened during your audition um, experience and what made them want to choose you for the fifth doctor? <clears throat> well, funnily enough, I didn't audition. I'm one of those very lucky people. I never had to audition for Doctor Who. I just got a phone call because I had been playing Tristan uh, uh, and I think they'd seen something in that that they liked and they wanted to bring an element of that so I, I, I never had to go along it was the days before you know nowadays every executive under the sun has to agree to you playing the part in those days it was really just the producer and the head of department but when I went for I so I suppose actually my audition was my all creatures great and small audition where um, they I went along and I was very I was very nervous because I was nothing like this character of Tristan believe it or not and they said to me, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, oh, yes, yes, I'd, I'd love a cup of coffee. And then they said, okay, let's read through the lines. And so they thrust the script at me, and I had the cup of coffee. And I was, didn't know whether to sip the cup of coffee or, or turn the script over. And I managed to spill the coffee all over myself. <laughs> uh, and I often think that the reason I got that part of Tristan was when they went back and, and over all the people they'd seen for the part and said to themselves, well, who should we get to, to play the part of Tristan and which one of these 150 people should we get? And they just sat there for a moment and one said, you know, how about the idiot who spilt coffee all over himself? <laughs> and and I, so I got the part. I was sort of cack-handed enough to, to spill my way into the part of Tristan and then into Doctor Who. All right, cheers. Cheers. Hi, um, I'm a huge fan of The Fifth Doctor but my mother is an even bigger fan of All Creatures Great and Small. 
Okay. And she wanted me to ask you if you have any funny animal stories that you remember, <laughs> like any of the bad stuff that happened. Like, <laughs> How funny is having your arm stuck up a cow? <clears throat> Pretty funny. <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> she thinks it's hilarious. You know, people are, people are I've been asked questions about uh, uh, where they've said, uh, were you really doing that, or was it a special effect? So the, the BBC aren't going to pay for a special effect of a cow's backside. I had no idea. I read the script. I thought, well, that's obviously going to be faked. And then we went up there, and we, we had to spend two or three days with the vet, who would show us around, you know, various farms. And he was, uh, he said, um, of course, this, by this time, of course, it was 1977. The series was set in 1937. So he would take us around to the farm. He said, well, what you do, Peter, is uh, when you get this, you, what you do is you put your arm up the cow like this. Now, of course, I've got a nice big rubber glove, but you won't have that in 1937. You just put a bit of soap on your hand and you go straight up the cow. And Chris Timothy and I are standing there going, he's not serious, is he? <laughs> and uh, Chris, to be fair, had to do it before I did. Um, uh, but it seemed to me, as I went on the rounds, that that's what vets do most of the time. You know, the cow has a sore throat. They go, right, better put your arm up the cow. <laughs> and uh, I must say, when I read, when I actually got the episode, when I, when I had to do this, this thing, uh, and I saw it, I thought, oh, no, 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 no. And the day got nearer and nearer and nearer until uh, finally it came, and I, I went along to the filming, and we were on a freezing cold hillside. The wind was blowing really bitterly, and the only warm part of my entire body was my arm. That makes sense. <laughs> so actually, I was quite happy. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Hello there. Hi. Oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> Hi. Hey. So uh, I was just wondering, because uh, I've seen videos of all the older actors kind of reading over monologues of the newer doctor actors. Uh, I believe you've done one, actually if I remember correctly. You mean do a... It was like a Matt Smith monologue that they got you to read, I believe. When was this? At a convention? It was at a convention, I think. Last There's... week, someone made me read out a Colin Baker speech. You're not going to do that, are you? No, 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 I promise I won't go that far. <laughs> I was just wondering, because you guys kind of get subjected to being compared to the other doctors, do you ever feel like you were the doctor in the wrong kind of time span, or do you think the time that you were the doctor was the perfect time for you? Well, looking back on it now, I think it was pretty good. I feel, good. well, at the time, I, as I said, I felt I was quite young to play the part. Now, from the perspective of today, and I look back, it seems like I was just starting a trend. Um, <clears throat> so I, 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 the only thing is I, I'm you know, slightly disappointed with is the fact that we had no ability to do special effects in the way that they can do them nowadays. Um, because we didn't really even have proper computers that would work or help us with digital effects. So I, I look at, on the new series with, with great envy. Um, so there's part of me which would love to have played the, the Doctor in the modern day, but uh, all in all, I'm very happy, you know. And Doctor, you're our Doctor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, two quick related questions. Okay. Soon, soon after you did Doctor Who, you went on to a very peculiar practice. What was it like doing that series just so soon after doing Doctor Who? <clears throat> it was a brilliant series to do. It was fantastically well written. And it's the first series I ever did when you didn't want to change a word of the script. It was written by Andrew Davis, who's famous now for adapting things. But he is actually a brilliantly original writer when he gets his bottom moving um, uh, and I wish he'd done more stuff you know purely original stuff but uh, it was just so well written you just get it and you'd think well I don't want to change anything I don't want to read I've, I've only ever had one other experience like that with a script um, which was for at home with the Braithwaite's which is a series I did which I don't know if you've seen over here but that was again it's quite rare in television to get a script where you don't need you don't need or you don't want to change anything um, it was a, a script that any, everyone at university, so many people who went to university have said, that must have been based on my university. Because it's just like, and it was, because it's every university. Uh, but it was terrific, and we had a great cast. 
I was the kind of straight man, really, in the middle of the mayhem, but it was still wonderful to do. All right, now, just before people found out about you being in Doctor Who, you were in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I believe, as the dish of the day. Yes. What was that like? <clears throat> I was the Amiglian Major Cow, the dish of the day. Yes, it was um, four hours in makeup and three minutes on the screen. Uh, uh, but it was, I was just pleased to be a part of it because um, my, my now ex-wife, but my then wife, was in, in the series playing Trillian. And this episode came up, uh, and they, I think they were sitting around over lunch, and they said, what we need for this part is someone who is well-known but doesn't mind being completely unrecognisable. And she said, oh, Peter will do it. <coughs> So that's how I came to do it. Uh, but I'd loved the radio series. I'd been a big fan of the radio series. And uh, I had, in fact, been checked out for the TV series for one of the major parts. But they very sensibly, I think, went with the radio cast largely. Uh, and so I didn't do that. So, but I was very happy to be involved um, as the dish of the day. It was great. All right. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, on the front of, of great scripts and you mentioning liking to change things, what did you change with uh, any Doctor Who scripts? Or do you remember an instance of, of making a modification? You'd there? have to make sense of them. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often, you know, the, uh, the writer, what happens is, it's weird, the writer understands what's going on. And then it goes through in the old days, because these people weren't, most of these people in the old days weren't big fans of science fiction, don't forget. I mean, we had, uh, um, you know, the producer certainly wasn't, the director almost certainly wasn't. Um, and so they got given a script and then, as script editors do, they, they change little bits, they change it. And quite often they change it so it didn't make any sense. And then I would come in, and I, because I was a fan of Doctor Who and I understood it much more than they did, we then have to sp spend the, you know, about three or four days plugging the holes. Right. Because they'd sort of you know, not really quite understood what was going on. And I, I was pretty good actually at that. So you, you, cha you change things all the time just to make things make more sense. Do they ever give you a writing credit? Oh gosh, no. <laughs> No, that just, that just comes under creative, uh, creativeness, doesn't it, really? That's just part of our job. It's not always a good idea. I don't really approve of actors rewriting scripts because, you know, writers, generally speaking, spend a lot of time, you know, working out exactly what they want to say. But in this case, and what happens quite often now in the, in the modern world, is the writers write their great scripts and then some other bugger comes in and changes it because, they, you know, they want to have put their fingerprint on it somewhere. Um, and somewhere, someone told producers that they know what they're talking about. And for a, 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 in, in a great number of cases, they, they don't really. I mean, the, in the old days, the best producers were the ones that facilitated everyone else making a great program. And what's happened in the last few years is people, they've begun to think, oh, I could, I've could, I got a good idea here. Let's do this, we could do this. It would be far better for everyone, I think, if they kept out of it. Yeah. The exception, of course, to that, I have to say, is Doctor Who. Because Doctor Who, they very cleverly um, have a writer as the showrunner who knows what, what they're doing. Um, and I, I know in a lot of uh, um, uh, American TV se sh series, for example, the writer is also the producer. And that seems to be by far the best way. We've got a bit of catching up, I think, to do. Agreed. <clears throat> Alcon!